Hey, I'm Nate Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently excavating in northern Texas, and I specialize in the archaeology of North America prior to its colonization by Europeans. This has been my primary field of study and work for over 10 years, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I want to talk about the archaeological significance of Mammoth Cave and Salts Cave in Kentucky. And most of what I'm going to talk about comes from a George Crothers paper titled uh, Early Woodland Ritual Use of Caves in Eastern North America. And I'm using this one as kind of my baseline because it does a really good job of taking a lot of information, putting it all in one place, and organizing it in a way that makes, makes some sense. And it's fairly easy to find online. Anyway, uh, the two caves, Mammoth Cave and Salts Cave, are given separate names because of their two main entrances, but they're actually connected to each other. And I'll mostly just use the term Mammoth Cave as a shorthand for the entire system, unless I have reason to do otherwise. Now, Mammoth Cave is the largest cavern system, cavern system in the world. It's over 350 miles long, and like most major cave sites, its protection from the elements and not in the non-acidic nature of the soil deposits, and it results in very good preservation conditions. So we tend to get things like wood and bone and textiles and other perishable materials that don't tend to survive in other open air environments like camps on the sides of, of rivers and in floodplains and things like that. So a couple of natural human mummies were also found in the cave, including one of a young boy about nine years old. Now, river cane torches are also found deep inside the cave, and so we have some direct evidence for how far inward the cave was being explored, and because they're wood, we can do radiocarbon analysis to give dates to these points that are being explored. And some of these go back as far as the Archaic period, but most of them cluster around the early woodland period, so about 3,000 years ago to 2,000 years ago, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, I will drop the link to my video explaining archaeological time periods down in the description if you need to get caught up on what the woodland period is all about. So Mammoth Cave was important to prehistoric peoples because it contains special mineral resources. Uh, gypsum is common in the cave and it can be used to make white pigments and paints. Um, Mirabolite and Epsomite are also found in the cave, and Epsomite is better known as Epsom salt. And both of these two mineral salts work, are, they're effective laxatives. And it wouldn't have taken very long for people exploring the cave to kind of figure out what, what these things were used for. Um, you'll remember that I said that the cave environment preserved materials that normally decay, and one of those materials is paleofeces, human excrement. Um, sometimes they are also called copper lights, but that kind of implies that they're fossilized, and that's not really what's going on here. Uh, and these materials are very strong evidence for things like human diet, what's what's going into people's gastrointestinal system, um, the environment, what kind of pollens are found in there, and even biological sex. So we know from the Mammoth Cave paleofeces that the early woodland explorers of the cave were consuming these last laxatives, and that the testosterone levels of these individuals are high enough to indicate that they were all biologically male. Incidentally, we also know that these caves, well, these cavers were living on a diet that included a lot of domestic plant crops from the eastern agricultural complex, like sunflower, goosefoot, maygrass. So Crothers goes on to ask what the connection is between these various mineral resources, the cave, the early woodland period, and the male sex, because these these kind of elements are clustering around each other and appear to be in fairly close association with each other. So people were in the region and had explored the cave, like I said, in the Archaic period, but it doesn't really become intensive until later. And there's not a good reason that women can't mine minerals from the cave, but the evidence from both the human remains and the testosterone levels and the paleofeces points overwhelmingly in the direction that this is this kind of mineral mining was a men's only kind of practice. So the explanation that Crothers gives involves a rite of passage initiating boys into manhood. Worldwide rites of passage involve physical trials and the extreme cold of the cave environments does put stress on the body after long periods of time. The cave tends to stay around 57 degrees Fahrenheit and that can lead to hypothermia if people aren't constantly moving and keeping their body temperature up. So also purging the body is a common element. 
either by vomiting or using laxatives. And the mineral salts provide a on-hand method to achieve that. Um, altered mental states are also a likely component of this ritual in particular, and, and a lot of these kinds of rites of passage rituals. Um, as the body was purged of nutrients, poor lighting of the cave, uh, stress from the cold temperatures, all of these can be contributors to mild hallucinations. And there's also some evidence to suggest that mild alcohols were consumed made from uh, maygrass and wild berries. Furthermore, symbolically, the cave serves as kind of a primordial womb, so like a boy enters, undergoes these, these trials and this rite of passage, and he's reborn as an adult male man member of the community. Now, as to why this rite of passage suddenly becomes so important in the early woodland period, Crothers uh, goes into some kind of deep in structural and even some Marxian archaeological theory. So what he argues is that it's all about the changing of the food economy, specifically the widespread adoption of planting and harvesting domesticated crops like sunflower and goosefoot and maygrass. Before people start producing their food, they simply collect what grows and what's available on the landscape. And the return on a person's labor is fairly immediate. So you go pick the blackberries, you eat the blackberries, and there's not really time for some outside group or person to steal the fruits of, of your work. You're going out and you're collecting of, of the food. So once people start to grow crops, there's a long delay in when the individual or the community reaps the fruits of their labor. And people are not generally willing to contribute work to a delayed return project like cultivating an agricultural field unless they are confident that they'll benefit from investing their time and energy. And this is where we see the emergence of things like property rights. Crothers is arguing that these boys are undergoing a rite of passage in order to initiate them as contributing members of their agricultural community. So initiates would have some sort of legal rights to a portion of the harvest, but also would have responsibilities from the community to both contribute to the cultivation of crops and to protect the land from invasion or theft or raiding by outside groups. And this is really important. It means for the first time, the being initiated into a formally recognized lineage or clan is necessary to secure one's food resources. And that makes the people who control clan membership, presumably community elders, much more politically powerful than was possible prior to the cultivation of crops. And this kind of system paves the way for social hierar hierarchies to emerge. And that's exactly what we start to see in the middle woodland period with things like the Hopewellian interaction sphere. So as always, I hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. And thank you for watching.